Lord be with you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this uh, glorious day that you've given us. We're so excited. Thank you for Ryan for his message. Thank you for each person here, Lord. We give you thanks for what you're going to do through your Holy Spirit. And we just invite your Holy Spirit into this place once again to uh, teach us what we need to know. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm actually from uh, Vancouver Island, which is just on the other side of Vancouver. So we, Vancouver Island is kind of the, the Hawaii of Canada. <laughs> and so, and so uh, people move there to retire but I'm not near that yet. Uh, but it's good to be here with the snow again. So it's funny to see that as a Canadian. Once upon a time, we got old. And we knew it was coming, everyone did. We were talked about often. And now they're not quite sure what to do with us. And we wonder, well, where do we fit in? Of course, we know where we fit in. We're like fine aged wine. We're getting better, fuller, better, sweeter. But let's be honest with each other. The question might be, what are they really saying about us behind closed doors? For some of us, uh, well, we're a burden. The older we get, the more they wonder about our life, our role, our function, our contribution. To others, well, we uh, have become quite a burden. Not sure what to do with us. We can become very expensive to maintain. Mm -hmm. And the church, what are they doing with us? What are they saying about us? The gray hairs that sit in the pews, there are many of us. Hopefully you have one of those churches that's thriving with young people and families. But we're kind of scared about the future too, aren't we? We look at the church, we look around us, and we wonder. The church is good to us. They offer a senior's Bible study. A knitting club. An opportunity to meet with other men at McDonald's. Maybe that rings a bell. <laughs> the aging of our communities, what's happening with them? What are they saying? What are we saying? And I'm wondering if it's kind of the same question that Jesus asked one day to his disciples. Who do people say that I am? Who am I? The aged of our community. And what will the remaining days of my life on earth really be about? Well, the truth is, is that your chapter, your last chapter or two, has not been written yet. And I wonder, and I wonder what it might include, what it will, will it be? Can you think? and ponder and wonder about the possibilities. I'm intrigued by the story of Simeon in the, in the Bible. And you know about this older gentleman. He is waiting to die. He is getting ready. He seems to have lived a pretty full life. But God tells him that it's not quite finished yet. I have one more thing for you to do. It says in Luke that the Holy Spirit leads him to this temple. And he says, you will not die until you see the Messiah. And then it will be finished for you. An old man wondering when his time will come, what it will be like. Here we read. Jesus, of course, is brought to the temple four months following his birth. And he comes to the temple and Simeon takes him into his arms. 
blesses him. And he says, Lord, now you are letting your servants depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, yet you have prepared in the presence of peoples a light for the revelation of Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. His father and his mother marveled at what has said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. It's time for Simeon to die. Did you hear what happens next here? There's another person involved. It's Anna and she's old too. She's from the tribe of Asher and she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting and praying night and day. And coming up the very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Don't you find it fascinating? One, Simeon fulfilled his purpose. He was old, ready to die. And the other, Anna, started again. She wanted to continue to share the message of this Jesus. Of this Jesus. I'm troubled by what I see happening with those who are getting older in our communities. And I'm wondering if they're missing out on the one or two or three more things that God wants them to do. I'm troubled about how we value those who are aged. What is the value we place on them? How do we see them as significant as part of our life, part of our churches, part of our communities? As Jujet said, I'm a I'm a pastor, but I'm also a bereavement counselor. I do a lot of workshops and trainings across Canada in every denomination. I do trainings in palliative care associations, uh, for funeral directors, for pastors, all kinds of different institutions. And I'm saddened. I'm saddened to hear how we treat the elderly of our communities. Last year, I went to an elder law conference. You're thinking, that's kind of funny. Pastor going to a lawyer's conference. But I wanted to see what they were teaching, what they were learning, what the areas of law they were more concerned with in regards to the elderly of our communities. And again, I was awestruck. I was the only reverend there out of 100 uh, individuals. It was kind of an interesting experience for me. They wondered, what are you doing here? I said, well, I care about elderly. I care about the seniors of our communities. Elder law conferences are significant because they tell us, they give us a barometer of what's happening within our society. And one of the fastest growing areas of law in North America is elder law. And one of them is elder abuse. Elder abuse, and maybe you have an experience with this. One of the big debates at that law conference was whether or not to put cameras in the rooms of nursing homes and lodges because of the abuse that was taking place with the elderly. Sadly enough, it was not only the abuse of the staff, but it was abuse that was taking place by family members, by friends. Isn't that sad? What do we do with people when their bodies begin to fail, when their minds begin to wander a little bit? It seems that society has given us some, some options. And I'm wondering if it's time for the church to stand up and give their options and speak them loud and clear. There are so many frightening statistics that uh, we need to consider, and I don't want to give just, as Ryan said, not the, the difficult parts of the conversation, but I think we need to recognize them. 
the rates of suicide, wow. High rates of suicide in the United States is in men midlife, but closely following that is those between the ages of 65 and 74. In this country, it's the 10th leading cause of death, suicide. In Canada, it's nine. Men age 85 years and older have a suicide rate of 43.2 43.23 per 100,000 compared to an overall average of 11.01 per 100,000. In the United States, Alzheimer's, yeah, Ryan talked about that. 5.7 million are living with Alzheimer's right now in the United States. 5.5 million of them are over 65 years of age. Alzheimer's is a sixth leading cause of death in the United States, in Canada, it's the fifth. What are we doing? What are we doing as church to meet the needs of those with Alzheimer's? With those who are lonely, who are looking at a way out called suicide, we can only refer to mental illness very briefly because it's also a huge, huge difficulty in all of our, both of our countries, people who become lonely and depressed. And there's this thing called euthanasia. Physician-assisted suicide are in Canada made. They keep lightening the language all the time. Medical assistance in dying, a bill that was passed a couple of years ago in Canada. It's okay to take your life. 30% increase in the last six months in Canada. It's frightening people choosing to end their life quickly. The average age of that person who decided to take their life was 73 years in Canada. 65 of those decided to end their life because of cancer. Cancer. We know that the three most difficult things, or decisions that people make in order to take their life, decisions are based upon three things. Number one, Lack of purpose, undue suffering, and burden on others. Those are the three things that people look at in making that decision. Do I have purpose? Can I handle the suffering? Am I a burden to my family? Church, do you think you can answer those questions? Do you think we can answer those from God's word and from scripture? What do we do with people? Elderly, when their bodies begin to fail, when their minds begin to wander. I really love this one scripture from Paul, 2 Corinthians 4.14. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly, we are wasting away, yet inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. We know that our bodies are going to grow old. They're not meant to live forever. But inside, we are growing strong. Do we have opportunities? Do we have purpose? You know, my first wife died at 47 years of age, and although she wasn't old, she, uh, we learned a lot from her about dying and about allowing life to come to an end when it needs to, not when we want it to. And she had ovarian cancer for five years, so it was quite a long battle for us and for our four children. But boy, the lessons we learned, the faith that was nourished for us and for our four kids that still linger in our hearts today and allow us to move forward were amazing. I remember the last uh, night that she, uh, she was living on this earth and she, we decided to have her at home and she wanted to die at home and, and she was in our bed. And earlier on that uh, day, she had gone into a, a coma state so she hadn't talked for a while and 
obviously she wasn't able to look at us and I wasn't able to look into her eyes and kind of said that I love you and before she went into that particular state and but you know as I as I laid there with Pammy her name was Pam that night as she was breathing heavily and she got into some suffering but we managed it through medication but as I laid there next to her that night I was I was begging God you know for the miracle I mean that's fair right even the last minute and one of the things that that I asked God I said God I just man, I just want to look at Pam one more time. I just, I just want to look into her eyes like one more time. And just like tell her I love her one more time. Well, I knew that wasn't going to happen because she'd already gone off into this coma state and time was drawing near. So Pam survived that whole night. And it was 6.20 in the morning. I'll never forget it. We woke up. And... Uh, Sister and brother-in-law came into the room and Pam was still alive. She was still breathing. And so we kind of turned her a little bit over onto her, one of her, onto her side there. And as we turned her, all of a sudden, her eyes opened. I thought, this is the miracle. This is what we've been praying for. And she got up she got up, forward in her bed, a woman who had been laying down for hours. I went, Pam, Pam. And I, I turned around to look at her, and her eyes, I've never seen her eyes, it's so blue in my life, she had these beautiful blue eyes, but that morning, like they were like sky blue. I said, Pam. Well, she didn't answer. And she didn't look at me, or she didn't look at Scott and Carol Ann, sister and brother-in-law, but she was looking ahead. And she smiled. And she laid down on the bed, and honestly, she crossed her arms. And took her last breath. It was amazing. You know, purpose to the end? Did she have a reason to live to that last breath? I mean, that experience I carry forward every day in my life gives me hope, gives me peace, it gives me joy. Our bodies are going to die. But we have purpose to the very end of our life. We really do. And we have a contribution that we need to make in this world that's still very significant. I think right now in our society, I think Ryan has said, we're kind of in a perfect storm situation in so many different ways. So many things happening in terms of people with Alzheimer's, cancer. One in every two people in North America are gonna get cancer. Doesn't mean they're gonna die from cancer, but they're gonna get cancer. Do you think maybe there's an opportunity for ministry waiting for us, not only within the church or outside the church? We have purpose. Aging is not just about us getting old. Aging is asking the question, what now, Lord? What purpose do you have for me now? What do you want me to do for you? That's still significant. What do you want me to tell others about you who don't know you? Do you want me to bring people closer to Jesus? How might we do that? To people who are old, people who are sick, people who are dying? Do they not have a voice that can be heard loudly? Probably even more loud. An experience once in a nursing home, first year as a pastor, little small little congregation I was serving and they had a nursing home where they had services. So you go in, take your turn and have a little message, a little piano playing, some singing, some prayers and they would bring all the people in, lots of them in wheelchairs. I didn't know anything about dementia or Alzheimer's at that point in my life. It wasn't kind of really that common even to know, have much knowledge about that 33 years ago. 
But there's this lady they brought in every time in a wheelchair. And she, she didn't respond. She just sat there and they bring her in and she was like this. And so I go up to her and I, you know, just I'd pray with her and she didn't respond, but I touch her because I know the power of touch. Didn't smile, just sat there. Well, one time I went in and I thought, you know what, today I'm going to do a, something special. We're going to choose your favorite hymns. I want you to choose your favorite hymns. And so this one gentleman says, I got one. I said, what, what, what's him? He said, I want to sing, Come to the Garden Alone. I said, great. Let's sing that. So the PNS began playing, I said, Come to the Garden Alone. And I kid you not, the chorus came on. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. As soon as we started singing that, that lady began singing at the top of her lungs. <laughs> and it stopped everybody else from singing because they couldn't believe that she was alive again for that moment. And we started singing the, chorus, or the verses again and then the chorus started up again and boom, she started singing at the top of her lungs. I went, wow. You know, even somebody we thought would have no purpose in life, that couldn't touch us in any way, came to life through that word, through her story, through what was embedded in her life so long ago that came to life, that touched us and touched others. This is the most important part of her life, the one who walks with her and talks with her and tells her that it's our own. I think one of the biggest challenges we live with is expanding the landscape of our lives when we get old. You know, when you're young, you always hear these words, there's a whole new world in front of you. you know, the possibilities are endless. The sky's the limit. The world is your oyster. Ever hear that as a senior? <laughs> Why not? What language do we use to spur our seniors on in their life, in their mission, in their purpose? Well, time is running out. <laughs> Got to get ready for the end. <laughs> it won't be long. What if we switch that language around to give people purpose and meaning back again and re help them realize that God does have something fascinating for them up ahead and that the next chapter, maybe it's the last one, maybe it isn't, but the next chapter has not been written yet. We have purpose to the very end of our lives. Even if you look at Jesus, you begin to realize that even though he knew that his life was coming to an end, he had purpose to the very end that God wanted him, his father, to fulfill. I love this whole picture of purpose to the end in Jesus' life because here he is hanging on the cross, suffering. It's fascinating for me because, I mean, why did God the Father allow him to suffer for so long? I mean, we know the outcome. He's going to die. He's going to rise again. That's the main thing. But why this suffering? Why, how, why did it have to continue for a while? Why so many hours on the cross? Because he still had work to do. And the work to do was around him. Think about that on the cross. Those who are around him that he was impacting the centurion, man who says, truly this man was an innocent man. Did something change in that man's life that day? Think of the soldiers who heard Jesus say, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Do you think that maybe that message they heard that day gave them a different understanding of who Jesus was? Think about the, the scene of Mary and John, you know, the mother, the mother of Jesus. 
What a beautiful, beautiful uh, act when Jesus is worried about his mom and her future. And he points to his beloved John saying, hey, your, your, your mom and your son, I'm developing this relationship. And, Mary, and then John took her home. And then that thief on the cross. Wow. Talk about a last minute rescue. <laughs> right? And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise. To the very last We have a purpose. Paul says, whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. And Paul says, it's better that I stay. I want to go, but it's better I stay for you. Our engagement with the age of our community is significant. And how we engage the church is really important for the future of the church. And if we're not thinking about the Great Commission as seniors, then we need to. Because we need to share the gospel message to the very end of our lives. An experience once in a hospital, I mean, I know many of you have had these same experiences. And it was a gentleman who, had, uh, who was dying and he was scared. He was really frightened. And the nurse phoned me if I could go to visit him. And I said I would. I didn't know him. Although I lived in this community of 5,000 people, I, I still didn't know him. And the nurse invited me to be with them, and I went into his room. And I went into the hospital room, and I walked into the front door, uh, into his room, and I said, hey, I'm, I'm Reverend Rickberg. Um, what's up? And he goes, well, I'm... He says, I've done some really bad things in my life. And I said, you too, hey? <laughs> I said, I've done some bad things in my life too. So what's going on? Well, this gentleman, in his words, had stolen away somebody's wife uh, 25 years earlier. And on his deathbed... Right? Because this stuff happens when you're dying. The guilt came back into his life. And he didn't know what to do with it. So I asked him that question. What do you want to do with it? What do you want me to do? And he says, well, I want to talk to this man. I want to tell him that I'm sorry. I said, well, what do you want me to do? He says, could you phone him for me? and invite him to come and visit me? And I said, sure. So I went home that day, and as I said, I was a community of 5,000 people, and I'd been there for 15 years, so I knew a lot of people, and I happened to know this gentleman who was a Christian. And I phoned him up, and I said, you know, uh, Bill would love to see you. Um, he's dying. I think he needs to hear from you. The response I got back was not favorable. And the language he spoke was not Christian. <laughs> I said, hold it. No, I'm not going to visit that. What he did to me, well, there was two gentlemen who were struggling with forgiveness, wasn't there? One at the hospital, one at the home. And I said, look, I said, you know, it's up to you. You might want to pray about this. But I said, I want you to think about yourself in that situation laying on the deathbed dying. Would there be some things in your life that you would need to clear up before you die? I left that phone call, and the next night, I visited this gentleman back in the hospital. And he was close, like he was really close to death. He could hardly speak at this point in his life. The cancer had really eaten away at his lungs. He had lung cancer. And I went into his room, but you know, as I walked into his room that day, there was something really dynamic that was happening. It was the Spirit. The Spirit of God was there. I knew it was there, and the look on this man's face was different. 
Um, in fact, in his own way, he was smiling. And I said, hey, Bill, what happened? He said, I, I, I can't believe it, he said. I said, tell me. He said, well, I told him I was sorry. And he said, I forgive you. I said, why did he forgive you? And he said, well, he said, I, I, he said, well, since God forgave him, he needs to forgive me. Wow, he said, that like God? Yeah. And I said, are you curious about this God? Yeah, he said. Can I tell you about him? Okay. So here we are, nine o'clock one night, talking about Jesus and sharing the gospel of Christ. The man gave his life to Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning, I left at 11. The man died. The man died. You know, right to the very end, the last minute, the conversations that we have with people about Jesus are significant. We need to hear their stories of where they're at. And when God gives us the Holy Spirit to guide, lead us to share our story, to draw people closer to Jesus. People often ask me, well, how do I get started in this? How do I get started in entering into people's lives to tell the story, whether I live or whether I die? Because really we have, we can tell our story now when we're living, when we're not sick, when we're healthy, but we can also share the story when we're dying. I found in my experience that when you're dying, you got a really captive audience. <laughs> people actually will listen to you because they have no choice. And so the conversations that we have in both those scenarios are significant. How do we get started? It's really simple for me, and I want to be practical here because I've put in front of you a little chart called Soulful Conversations. If you want to look at that for a minute. The way that I use this particular chart, I call this a circle of influence as well. Who close to me, who are those people close to me? who I spend time with. I use this in my counseling because often we know that people impact us, so I know who, who those people are in my life. But for me, in the center of the circle would be myself and my wife. Of course, God is at the very center. But then I began to look at this. Who are the others in my life that are important to me and significant? It's my four kids, Devin, Kira, Marissa, Jeff. It's my grandkids, Jake and Ella. And Connor. Oh, from that, it could be my brother Dan, my sister Carol, my sister in law, my brother in law, my mom, her husband. Outside of that circle, it could be neighbors, it could be people I play hockey with, my neighbors. When I began to look at this particular chart, and if you ask this question, you'll be find your ministry as a senior, and ministry even as an individual follower of Christ, circle on that chart people who don't know Jesus. And then you'll know where to begin your conversations. The question I get asked more than, the one question I get asked more than, more often than not in my church is this one from people. The thing that, they're wor the thing that keeps them up at night, the one thing that keeps a, a lot of my congregants up at night, especially if they're seniors, are there family members that don't know Jesus? That's their biggest concern. That's your biggest worry. As you get closer to that time, and you have those in your life, 
All of us do. We need to enter in the conversations with those individuals through what I call soulful conversations. Soulful conversations. Expanding the landscape. Do you find it interesting that Jesus spent time with only 12 people most of the time? There's a reason for that. He was building into those relationships for the future of the faith, for the future of his message to carry forward. Twelve, one kind of went astray, badly. <laughs> but those other ones continued on the faith forever. And he cared for these individuals when he is living. He entered into conversations of significance when he is living, and he has significant conversations when he is dying with them. And that's what we need to do as individuals, especially as elders. You have a purpose. I'm a senior, I guess, almost, because I went to IHOP and I, I got the seniors' menu prices. It starts at, 50, starts at 55. But I'm turning 60 this year. So I'm getting into that framework, into that mindset. But I'm not retiring because God still wants to use me as he still wants to use you. We need to expand the landscape. We need to enter into conversations with people that are significant. What I've done for you, I think that might be helpful is I've given you the questions to ask to enter into these conversations. I'm a narrative therapist as well. So I'm trained narratively in my counseling skills. And narrative is really about helping people to understand their present story, to understand their future one. I don't deal with the past. I deal with what is happening now and what God has in the future. So a narrative therapist is all about the possibilities, the what ifs, the coulds, the shoulds, the wonders. I'm curious, what's next? Questions that lead to deep conversations, that lead to deep questions that are taking place in the soul. In the soul. I think I'm correct in saying that our role, our job as a follower of Jesus Christ is to care about the soul of every individual. Is it not? And so we need to get into those conversations to bring people closer that they can experience the love and the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus that you and I have. Let me close with this story about one of those individuals in my circle. Jake. My grandson. Three years of age. The story takes place eight months ago. We went to visit them. They live on a farm. Erica, my wife, and I went to visit them, hang out. And it was the last supper before we were heading back to Victoria. I was at one end of the table. Jake was at the other end. Jake's communication, I mean, he doesn't have much. He's starting to talk a little bit back then, but you know, his words were pretty limited. We had our prayers, and then Jake got up from the table. And Jake's a little guy. And he turned his chair, and he began to push it. And his mom said, Jake, where are you going? We're going to have supper. And he goes, Pa. Pa. And you see this little guy pushing his chair all the way around the table. Pa. I'm getting closer. Getting closer. I'm getting closer. So finally, his chair is just beside mine just enough, close enough so that he can hop up and sit on my lap and eat my food. 
but engage me. And you know, for me, that's an illustration of what we need to do as Christians. We're hoping through our conversation with people to bring people around closer so they can sit up in the lap of our Lord Jesus and experience all that he has to give them. And through our questions, through our inquisitive inquiry, we call that narrative therapy, through these curious questions, we allow people to go deeper into their soul to discover who Jesus is. And by sharing our story, we connect them to the living God. You and I, as seniors, and those in your community, in your churches, have a purpose. Have a purpose. And it's simply telling your story and hearing somebody else's. Because you know what? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Sing a little louder. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All around the neighborhood, all around the neighborhood, I'm going to let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I'm going to let it shine. All in my family, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. At my back table there with Angus for Life Canada, I have some books called Curious, uh, it's actually this one, Soulful Conversations. And also pick up a copy of these conversation starters. And could you do me a big favor? Could you try them? <laughs> and, if, and, and could you email me and tell me how they worked in your life? And pray about that person in your circle of influence. Use these questions and see what God will do in your life. Amen?